Hi everyone, it's uh, Sam and Jesse from ING office. I'm from the WBA Advanced Analytics uh, team and Jesse is from ING Analytics. So welcome uh, this afternoon or in, at least in, uh, in our time zone, welcome this afternoon uh, for the second online data engineering meetup. Uh, we are very excited. Um, can you please confirm that we will, that you hear us so that we're, uh, that you, uh, are sure in terms of technology. Um, yeah, so we have three amazing speakers this afternoon, yes. uh, even one all the way from Singapore. So uh, for him, it's uh, now very uh, late in the evening. So we're very happy that he will join us. So everyone hears us loud and clear. So uh, <laughs> let's start. Let's start and uh, let's give the podium to Prince Kerr, is the, our chapter lead from the Singapore office. First time he is joining us on this online uh, event uh, meetup and we're very proud. So good luck, Prince. So let's, uh, let's start with his, uh, his first talk of this uh, data engineering meetup. Guys, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, yeah, guys. Um, this side prints. Um, I work as a chapter lead in ING Bank for uh, we, we, we do a data analytics. Uh, we had the data analytics and the regular reporting for Asia branches. Uh, we have around about nine branches and we do extensive use of these technologies from a MSBI stack to a Power BI. So I've been experienced in Power BI for so long. Uh, I think almost seven, six, seven years. So, so th that's that's my personal uh, so-called uh, profile. Um, uh, so let's start. Um, uh, so, what I'm going to discuss today is mostly about the Power BI and the way we can use Power BI for our so-called ad hoc reporting. As we all know, we know data engineering stuff that we know how to get the data and all this stuff. The the issue is that what people say is that ninety percent of work is done in the back end only 10% shows up, but actually the, sh the showing of the reporting, the analytics part, the front end is the major part that if you cannot present what is back in the back end, it doesn't help people make good decisions. Uh, this is where we come up with uh, these so-called as Power BI architecture, uh, so the so-called Power BI ad hoc reporting tool that can help you with a very, uh, very uh, fast and a very good decision making report dashboards on it. So let's get started with the with first with the architecture. Okay. So what is this Power BI architecture? Power BI is part of a MSBI suit, Microsoft uh, suit, where it uh, it helps you do a lot of reporting stuff. Uh, starting with the uh, uh, so you can define Power BI into three tier architecture. The way the first kind is the data sources. You can have n number of data sources across. As you know, Microsoft allows a lot of data sources to be attached to the Power BI as, as well. Then you have a Power BI desktop. That is a that is a layer where you develop your reports. You can see what you're doing it with the data. You can see what is there. And then it comes to cloud services of Power BI. That is more of your how you display your reports, how you publish your reports, how which all people can see and all that stuff. Um, then with as we know the data is being a very sensitive information across the whole organization we power bi it gives you a gateways to interact with data because sometimes people don't uh, let your data go onto clouds and all those services so they uh, where microsoft steps in and tells it okay fine guys you can have your data in your systems in your sources we won't publish it on our cloud services but you can still use our cloud services to uh, show the dashboards and all the stuff and then comes your how you access the reports, the real stuff, okay? Uh, it tells you where it, uh, you can have it on your mobile reports, you can have your CEO can see uh, the so-called your KPIs very fast in a very, very fast-paced manner on the so-called mobiles and all that stuff. And it, so this is, this is in short, is a small architecture of the whole Power BI. Uh, let me see. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So how do we do? How do we divide? Uh, uh, how do we divide this uh, so-called uh, analytics solution? Uh, analytics solution has certain parts and components to it. One is the uh, first is your so-called data layer, where your extraction happens of the real data. And in in composite, Power BI gives you Power Query editor to do those things for yourself. Then you have a data modeling. Power BI has its data models also. Then it comes the data storage. 
Power BI has a very, very good engine in terms of the data storage. That is a DAX storage engine, which uses a tabular model. It's a vertex. It it it, it summarizes. It it so much comprises your data in such a zip uh, in so so much zip that it you can have tons of data without any performance issues as of today. Okay. Then comes the data retrieval. How do you retrieve the data? You have SQLs and those things. In, in in Power BI, you have a DAX query and M queries that we will discuss later on the slides also. Then analysis tool. You have a very good analyzing tool in terms of Power BI also. You can have your Python and R also integrated with Power BI. And you have a lot of visualizations to view those stuff and, and can give you, can predict a good story, can project a good story out, out of the whole report. Uh, the presentation itself is it's you have visualizations that that's something we will cover later on the slides also then comes how does this power bi working arch architecture happens okay you you have you have two halves of the power bi architectures one is your upper half that is more of your cloud services that uh, it gives you then the lower half is what where your data resides into systems Sometimes people don't even use the upper half. They all use the mainly the lower half where they have the report server also published within their systems, where they don't they don't even go outside of anything. So it depends upon what kind of stuff you want to do with the Power BI, uh, and the way the way your data so called your data integration, your so called integrity of your data, so called confidentiality, which one you want to share on the cloud service, which you don't want to share. That is something you can decide on the way it goes across. Today, the basic uh, the basic uh, topic what we want to discuss is how Power BI is useful in doing a lot of analysis. So uh, we will show show you why Power BI is uh, ad hoc. Uh, why Power BI is what are the use cases for the Power BI being a uh, why do we should we use Power BI for ad hoc reporting? One, Excel is quite an old tool now. Excel doesn't allow integration with a lot of data sources. Uh, others others cannot do it, and then it has a uh, uh, you can. Uh, in Power BI, you can connect your data warehouses. You can combine various data sources together. DAX query being from a business user perspective is a very, very easy language, but it's a complex, but still an easy language if you do a lot of lot of small analysis and all this stuff. So these are the stuff that you can, why we prefer Power BI to be used across with users. Uh, how do you create a report? So it tells you a clear steps. How do you create a Power BI report? How the data integration happens? First is how where your data integration you have to integrate your data into the system in the application. So this is where your data integration happens. Then you have a lot of transformations. People say you people don't get a lot of transformation from Power BI, but I can tell you there is not a single task that I can do it in SSIS that I cannot do it in Power BI from, from regarding a transformation. So, so there are ways out of it to do things. There are stuff that you can do it across. So these are the different things you can, a uh, uh, lot of transformation that we will see also in the later slides uh, here. People say you can do data modeling. CM data modeling can be done in Power BI as well. You can see uh, I have put a screen, small screenshot of us, very small facts and dimensions across. So this is a very small data model, but you can have, create a big data models as well. Um, then you go and define what is your driving. Uh, then you define and drive your KPIs, how, how you want to drive this data out of it. That is something in the later slides. Then, then the last part is how you put your report and publish the dashboards. Comes the next one. It it gives you a very small slide uh, to show how does this Power BI desktop looks like, and where are the stuff from the each each gives you how you import data, how you format, how you enrich data, how you set relationships, build your report template, and all that stuff. So this is how you, the whole simple steps of Power BI, how to create simple reports. Okay, now let's jump into the real real stuff of data analysis. Okay, so we'll start with. How does Power BI do a forecasting? You can do a forecasting in Power BI. A user that doesn't understand so-called algorithms and all this still can do a Power BI forecasting. It's, it's very simple steps. Uh, I'll tell you what does Power BI uses as, as a forecasting model. It uses an exponential smoothing model. Uh, it uh, it uses a two techniques. It's called as ETS AAA and ETS AA N models. What does ETS stands for? It's an error transform, uh, uh, error trend, and uh, and the seasonality. Okay, so uh, so what does this uh, error trend and seasonality means to? Okay, uh, so uh, so so you you know you see there are some 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 businesses where you have a lot of seasonal data. For example, winter's clothing will be 
will be much of higher use much of hi- higher profitability in in so called uh, winter season uh, as compared to in summer season so that's that's something called a seasonality maybe it can be quarterly seasonality also it all depends what kind of seasonality you have it okay uh, so so ets uh, how does ets works so ets uh, ets this ets this, if you see this models under ets triple a and double a n what it predicts that ets double a uh, what is triple a and what is double a n means to it okay so error term what is an error term it can be additive and a multiplicative i can sh- i'll show you later on the the formulas across it okay how does it work so same uh, same same for the trend term also it can be additive it can be of a uh, so called multiplicative even it, it can be of no trend it can be a very straight line streamline there is not there might be a very a very flat line that doesn't have, doesn't show any trend across the across the time series so uh, and then seasonality comes seasonality is the is a one of the major factors to determine which model out of this ets it will use so basically what we are going to do we are going to start with ets double a n model so what it d- tells you it it's actually equivalent to hall linear model that that we have it okay so uh, you will uh, you will only can use this model because if you remember i told you ets xyz if you convert it to double a n it tells you it has a error term that can be additive it should have a trend that is additive see it cannot have a seasonality data so if you have don't have a seasonality data then it tends to use this model to do the forecasting prediction okay uh, so it, it's equivalent to arima model that you will see that auto regression uh, auto regressive inter, uh, integrated moving average model so it, it follows the same uh, same stuff here also so if you see uh, I, i'll give you just an stamp example uh, it gives you a google stock google stock doesn't have any seasonal date seasonal impact to the data uh, uh, about the stock prices because google is just google it, it doesn't matter whether it's it's it's, it's quarter whether it's month 1 or month 2 or time period 1 or time period 2 is still the same so it doesn't have seasonal data when you don't have a seasonal data then it tends to forecast with a with a very straight line okay uh, then comes the ets triple a model uh, it's 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 equivalent to a triple exponential smoothing model also so if you see uh, uh, for example the a milk production might go up and down due to the uh, seasonal uh, with respect to dairy uh, dairy farms uh, stuff uh, correct so that that's how it works in the for the seasonal data then uh, so you will see sometime peak sometime uh, sometime very lows uh, so that's how the how it works let's get back get into a, okay now we being in a covid situation so i i thought this would be a better example to showcase okay if you see this um, it it is following a double a n model because it doesn't show any seasonality data okay so if you see this data across uh, what i have done uh, okay uh, i have forecasted from the data from uh, january till till may 26 or 27 something like that so i had that data from uh, uh, from the uh, from the internet and then we just put it as an active cases per per day uh, on that day what is the end number of active cases on that day so if you see the whole forecasting done by power bi let me go to the the real data give me a second yeah yeah okay so now we are on the power bi report itself so if you see uh, you can see this orange line this orange line depicts the forecasting so what i did to check my uh, to check my forecasting uh, uh, whether it it works fine or not uh, what i did i ignored 6 months uh, i ignored almost a month of data to see whether Where, where what is fo- being forecast is actually on the same lines what is being the actual values okay so so if you see this uh, uh, so you you can see the upper bound and the lower bound it it tells you about the how much confidence level we have it so right now i have put it as a confidence level as 95% so interval so that at least uh, uh, to make sure that the data stays in this because of covid 19 there there are a lot of peaks and a lot of drops so, so that that is the reason i have not uh, i haven't practiced this i haven't made this machine learning too many stuff so that it i, I don't have a, too much of confidence level so i have put a, a bigger confidence interval out there so how does this works so i'll just give you an example okay um, i'll change this forecasting uh, okay i'll change this forecasting confidence interval level to 75% you will see the impact okay see it it got decreased but still if you see 
our forecast lines and and the real actual lines are are actually almost similar so it's it it uh, when i calculate the percentage of change that is there in between uh, we call it as a, a rmc uh, map matrices it shows map percentage matrix shows me around about 8% deviation and i think that is a very good forecasting in that sense so that so so we can see power bi is actually able to forecast very uh, very closer to the accurate values uh, to be honest as long as this values um, uh, so i'll i'll explain in next slides what are these uh, values towards map M mpsc and all those okay give me a second so i just showed you that forecast length and how does it works uh, so what it tells you it can power bi gives you a, gives you a so called uh, uh, sorry uh, power bi gives you so many uh, so many uh, variables that you can play around with for example you can play around with uh, what kind of uh, how much how many how many months of data you want to see how many months of forecasting you want to see or how many years or how many time periods you want to see and you can always test your model by ignoring certain months so either you you can ignore your months as per as per your need basis for example you know there are some outliers that you don't want to put into the system so you can remove those by using this ignore months but if you have certain um, uh, but even for for testing also you can use this ignore months so that at least you can see whether your prediction levels are going properly or not uh, and this confidence interval level we have already discussed what is this confidence interval is all about so so there are two very good accuracy method that you can always use to see whether it's it's there or not uh, so one is rmc that is root mean square error so if you go ahead and check your actual whatever you okay let me show you one more thing uh, it does does not only tell you the values you can see the values also okay so you just seeing this here you just right click okay show as table if you show it as table it tells you okay initially there is no forecasting because i i asked it to focus from may month give me a second bye okay so if you see you have a forecasted value from 26th because i said started uh, ignoring one month from 26th may so it started forecasting from this value so if you can see it's it's a very close values when you see it around so 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 that way uh, you can see the 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 uh, your forecasting model is very nearby and you can use this value to derive this formula uh the percentage uh, the map percentage so this is what uh, this is how confidence uh, you can see if if it's more than 20% then that's the time you start thinking whether you really want to use the uh, the model or uh, there's some another regression or another statistical model that you want to use it um now going back going to the next uh, next next kind of analysis how does uh, so power bi gives you a very interactive reports as well so you can have a uh, you can it, it acts like an application itself in itself and then you can interact with the report you can tell something and it will give you a results back out so so i used a one simple sensitivity report so what is the sensitivity analysis is in finance it is told us uh, how your target how your target is effect target variables are affected with the changes in another dependent way uh, independent variables so what it tells you it gives you it, it is also called as what if analysis so what if this if you increase this person what if you should decrease that person what if it is a uh, uh, change in this numbers so i'll just give an example for example you had a uh, what example i have put it across uh, there's a there's a seller who so sells it uh, widget at 1000 and it has some transactions maybe 100 transaction what it sees for every 1000 views on her her site it tell it it shows her show it gives her almost around about 10% increase or 5% increase just just a sample okay so so what if it, if she goes do and this sensitive analysis she can always see okay fine for example if i increase the number of views on my site it can increase my transaction it can increase my sales for example if i increase it to 20% then it it, it increases my sales by another 10% something like that so so these are the stuff you can do with power bi also i I'll, i'll show you this how this sensitivity if you can see the formula it tells you a change in the dependent variable and a parameter and a state variable that gives you the real uh, output of the sensitivity okay uh, it has uh, okay before i go through this i'll show you a small demo to tell you across give me a second 
okay so just uh, just take an example of a of a of a of a any any small retail shop okay so what it tells it tells uh, it tells that its current profit previous year profit was 10 million he wants to forecast a profit to a 14 million okay but but in the meantime he still wants his desired profit to change uh, so he tells no 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 uh, uh, let's put a desired profit that changes uh, get uh, maybe i want around about uh, so called 20 million profit okay so so he wants to know what should i change in my cost price to show me that it gives me a profit of 20 million so for example so cost price has to decrease then only your profit goes increases so what it tells if he if he changes his uh, cost price by 20% he can gain 100% of his desired profit correct because that's that's a control he can have it and if you see the the uh, the below ones i'm i'm uh, these above ones are with the single parameters the below ones are with the multiple multiple scenarios for example if he changes cost price by 20% so if you see uh, if you see this color coding what it this color coding tells you this uh, this is simple way of showing people that these are the green ones are the ones that can meet your targets what are your desired profit is all about okay so for example uh, if he needs a 40 million just just a sample okay he wants to increase the profit to maybe 24 million so only if if he only does an increase uh, a decrease of 30% cost price then only he can achieve it or he has to do a, a both percentages maybe a 20% decrease in cost price but a 20% increase in selling price also can get him that target so this is a very interactive way of power bi using all this stuff so going back to the slides okay so the, uh, people will say what is the what is the difference between sensitivity and scenario analysis it's a, a, it's it's a very basic scenario is is the one that happens in the market okay scenario that that has an external factors att attached to it it doesn't only have uh, you cannot control those factors for example this sensitivity you just uh, you're predicting on the basis of what is there changing the each state of the variable across different 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 values but scenario is 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 kind of a market maybe a market is changing for example this covid situation came in that doesn't it doesn't matter whether it's uh, your uh, uh, so called uh, uh, you won't cannot have a, a covid as a sensi uh, under sensitivity analysis so so these are the stuff that is a difference between a sensitivity and scenarios uh, for uh, if you go by the examples uh, what 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 is put out there so someone used the manufacturing uh, he started having a manufacturing company for certain things so for him he can he can play with cost price selling price so called demand and all this stuff but he cannot predict those scenarios scenarios tells you from a very uh, from a best case scenario to a worst case scenario so so that's that's what is the difference between sensitivity and a scenarios within sensitivity you can have a different values of variables to show the end results so that that's how but you can see even these kind of reports are very possible in power bi so so these are very co called as a very interactive reports where you can where people can play around and still get the re desired result from that uh, reports uh, okay now going um, so these are some of the advantages as, as well as the of the approaches that someone should keep in uh, mind while doing this for example sensitivity analysis requires very every independent dependent variable be studied in detail manner but for scenario it's more of a uh, different scenario what you can do to win win a certain particular situation same if you go by a fact checking sensitivity analysis helps company determines the likelihood of the failure of a given variables uh, but when it comes to scenario it more of forecasting the future events it trying to see what what will happen in future that can impact the whole performance of the company so for certain things like for example this uh, covid situation no one no one predicted that covid can come and impact businesses in such a big big manner so th that is a scenario whereas uh, uh, reporting with sensitivity is more of a percentages increase and decrease of the stuff okay uh, let me go to the next one okay uh, so i showed you already this what kind of different studies you can work it with the sensitivity how the profits can up and down and all those scenarios so 
so it it uh, so for, from a from a from a it, it can be used within finances also where you can do so budgeting and all this stuff but it, uh, that is a different use cases that you can put it across so 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 it just uh, just showing the the power of the power bi what can it can be done and what cannot be okay now comes the the real magic of power bi so power bi allows lot of analytical uh, uh, toolings to be attached to it like python like r so you can imagine because sometimes people say python and r is more difficult to be an interactive reports or more so called you need a lot of coding skills from a python perspective and r perspective to get into the so called uh, uh, making interactive pages and all those stuff uh, and and the display reporting graphs are are also less interactive and or less attractive in a sense as compared to power bi so you can come you can combine these two together to make your analytical solutions for example you can allow uh, you can allow uh, power the uh, power of the python and it 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 doesn't only allow python and uh, it allows machine learning it has text analytics also within embedded within the power bi uh, the only thing is that you have to be on a premium membership to access this text analytics and machine learning for python and r you can just be a normal user to access those things so what does this power bi uh, allows you to do even power you will see very less visualization on the on those dashboards but if you go you can have a very custom visualization and it's all free so you can see there are multiple levels of uh, multiple levels of visualization where you can define your kpis it's it's it's, it's a well defined stu structure out there that can be used to do all these things uh, now let me go back to the power bi okay give me a second okay okay so what we did i did a very small example of example of a power bi using a prediction model for using a multi linear regression model okay so what i did i just used uh, some some sales data from a uh, uh, from from a so called uh, uh, companies uh, when they put up their advertisement against youtube uh, tvs radios and newspapers so i used that simple data set to uh, show how how does the two two things can be interacted okay so you can always use because python and r are better tools to do data cleansing data massaging data uh, so called uh, uh, all those statistical model machine learning modules that are very very strong parts of python and r that can be used uh, and then you can append that result set of those uh, or you can use those power, uh, so called data set to power bi and and that's to complete the interactive dashboard that we can build it now so for example uh, Okay, give me a second. Yeah, so give me a second. Okay, yeah. So it it shows you the whole uh, uh, machine learning uh, model of the linear regression. So I just did a so called uh, I just did a test and train and do the linear regression and got those coefficients values out of it. Uh, but I you can straight away use this into Power BI as well. Give me a second. Okay. So. i'll just go and edit the query okay so if you see this small demo uh okay what i did i run these python scripts just i'll show you the same python script that i showed you on the uh, jupiter notebook the same python script i ran it on the my uh, my power bi itself so it gives me all these tables the output of the python so i can use this now power of python and r to give uh, to put a good interactive dashboard okay so uh, it's a very easy stuff you can just transform it with the you can run this python script and you can get it across okay uh, i'll i'll share a link in the youtube video to show how how to use those python scripts in that okay uh, now coming back to my dashboard report same same thing what i did again was with the what if analysis what if report analysis uh, you can input input certain values so i'll just show you a sample data out of this okay so what it tells you it tells you a simple data on january what is the, uh, what is the in, uh, amount of uh, investment you did in and, and what was the output on the sales for particular products so so these are in millions and these are in in dollars so a certain thing like that so what we did i just did a uh, okay coming back to this so uh, so if you know a linear regression has a simple equation of uh, intercept plus your change in each of coefficient values with respect to the independent variables 
uh, and then you can predict the actual value and it gives you uh, okay so so this equation now i'll put it as part of the of power bi so so what i did i i read the integration model but i use this equation in dax so that's how i've combined two very wonderful analytical tools together to get the output okay so so the same equation i showed you already now how i can use the same inter uh, to do this regression equation uh, how we can use this uh, uh, convert this equation into the dax so dax is a very powerful power query language which depicts a lot of stuff uh, uh, you can do lot of, even the whole of the modeling can be done here but uh, that is for some some time later uh, it it would be a very advanced versions uh, so so th those some uh, that's something we will i'll cover in maybe i i can share the link later on to show how the how the dax can be used to do those but uh, to show just a sample where python can be used and and i have used a very simple example there are multiple i think there are thousand of use cases that you can see it across in the in outside world to combine these two to do a good interactive dashboard so what it tells so it it gives you the coefficient values for each of the component and it and it sums it with the input values so you can see what is the return you will be getting across okay so for example i'll just show it in front of you okay um i go ahead and told okay i think uh, my coefficient value with tv is the most so i think i should invest more in tv ads to get me the more more values in the uh, predictive values so i change this one so i change this one it it tends to change the value of the my my predicted sales so that's how 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 good power bi is so you can imagine uh, so you can imagine people using this dashboards to uh, do lot of their business decision making uh, to get in onto the real uh, on on the real end output of the values okay uh, you you can use power bi in lot of more other stuff uh, like a very interactive dashboard for loans and all those stuff in financial markets you can have a lot of uh, uh, you can use rs and all those equipments together so you can what i showed you is 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 what visual uh, from a so called data massaging and and uh, statistical model and all this so you can always use python for the visuals also if you think python visual would be more in Uh, uh, more good in sense, or you don't don't find a, a visual that can suffice your requirement. You can always use Python visual also. You can integrate Python visuals also with the Power BI. So that's how the whole whole of the scenario works in the uh, in Power BI. And there are multiple examples I can cover only these many in short short time frame. I hope you would have uh, got certain certain uh, certain stuff, certain knowledge, or a certain areas where you guys can work it out. uh so uh that's it from me i think uh, i think i can we can go towards questions and answers yes prince thanks a lot for your uh, for your talk um i think we have a uh, time for um since we're a little bit running out of time we have uh, uh time for one question i think the biggest one is uh what ing is using power bi for especially uh for data engineering and which kind of data do we use okay so uh, so uh, as as i told you we are doing a lot of uh, interactive dashboards so we do a lot of variance analysis within the uh, uh within our power bi stuff so what we do as part of our rig reporting area we use power bi for toolings like uh, someone has to do a variance analysis between rip months how does the trend is happening from the balance sheet perspective what are the what are the lending products or which are the clients that are very very much useful or which are the more uh, more uh, uh, more profitable clients which are the clients we should focus more area on those kinds of thing dashboards we can use it for the, for from a power bi perspective to show to the clients and the data where it sits in as part of data engineering is that uh, every every report needs the data across so these are the stuff where it comes uh, uh, where we get the data from our systems and we integrate power bi into our report servers and our reports are not shared beyond uh, it has a lot of security protocol so we don't use any of the cloud services we all are on the so called in house pub in house services i i mm -hmm. hope it answers the questions 
Yeah, so uh, I hope as well for uh, Shimon. Uh, so in the YouTube channel, we saw a lot of diff uh, a, a lot of more questions, but because of time, we don't um, unfortunately we don't have time for it. But uh, if Prince is okay with it, we will share uh, his contact details. So if you really want to um, uh, get answered, you will you can get in contact with him. Uh, having that said. Prince, thanks a lot for uh, joining us uh, from Singapore to give your uh, talk. It was very interesting. Uh, and then I think now it's time for our uh, second uh, speaker. So we have Alex. Uh, Alex is a co-founder of a company called Knight Analytics. And they are a software company specializing in entity resolution and knowledge graphs. Uh, she will give a talk about... Um, three different languages, uh, Python, uh, Julia, and Go. Uh, why choose when you can have them all, or all three of them? Uh, so uh, Alex is going to talk a little bit more about that, something as background information, uh, if you want to know more about her. Uh, she uh, likes to have long walks in the countryside. She likes spicy foods, good manicures. And she recently, since Corona, she uh, restarted playing AOE2. Uh, so hopefully that gives us an, uh, her a nice introduction. And uh, I would say, Alex, uh, take it away and have fun with this talk. Thanks, guys. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, you can say in the chat if you can't. Um, so my talk is maybe somewhat controversial because I think it's quite obvious that there might be some downsides to having multiple languages in your um, code base. But I think also with the kind of growth of microservice architecture, this might be less of an issue. Um, so basically, my company had quite a number of requirements for picking a language to develop our product in. And there isn't really a one size fits all. Um, so we kind of were looking at what kind of value we could get from mixing and matching and also kind of how we can do that mi mixing and matching. Um, a few caveats before I get started. Uh, because I'm talking about languages, I know that there's a bit of an inevitable, oh, but have you tried this one? Um, no, I probably haven't tried <laughs> every language, but uh, I'm very open and happy for advice on other languages that I should get to know. So feel free to put those in the comments. Um, I picked these particular languages for reasons that I'll discuss in the presentation and hopefully I'll be able to outline uh, the kind of criteria that I have for reviewing them. So a bit more um, professional background about me. Uh, I originally studied mathematics and economics and for the last eight years or so I've been building and deploying um, you can call them advanced analytical models, machine learning models also as a consultant. Because of that consultancy background, it means that I've been kind of put into teams with many, many different data scientists, different data engineers, um, loads of different data challenges and uh, deployment challenges. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in, uh, well, over 15 tier one or global banks and insurance companies, which means, again, I've kind of met many different um, problems uh, and challenges to overcome a uh, bit more personal stuff so i'm originally from the uk which you can probably hear in my voice but i now live uh, in utrecht in the netherlands um i started night analytics by myself two years ago originally uh just to do some freelancing consultancy work um but i had the niggle in the back of my mind that i had a, a good idea that i wanted to turn into a product so i was developing that on the side um, and it was the beginning of this year that I decided to actually uh, put the time in to launching my business as a software uh, company. So we build entity resolution algorithms, which is essentially kind of knitting together and pulling together siloed data to give a single view of either individuals or, or businesses. So a bit about our needs. We... Um, often dealing with really high volume data and we are building these distributed knowledge graphs. So there were a few core components. We needed stability, scalability, speed and simplicity, which I think is the core for any uh, good enterprise software. But we also needed great data science support as um, AI is kind of built into multiple parts of our product. 
So during the presentation today, I'm going to look through the kind of strengths and weaknesses um, of all of the languages and talk about why we went for a combination of Go with Julia and or Python. And then I'll show you a very high level architecture of essentially how we got them to work together. So the first criteria I was looking at um, is adoption and libraries. Um, the question I was trying to answer from a business and technical point of view was, um, is it easy to get started? How is the support of these libraries or um, languages going to be? Uh, will I be able to hire people to do these uh, jobs? And do, do we think it has longevity? Um, you can see the two graphs that I've put in. The first one is um, Stack Overflow Trends graphs, which actually show the percentage of questions asked uh, in each month for the given um, for the given languages. And you can see um, that Python just far overshadows Go and Julia. I think that's to be expected from what most people know about Python. Um, when you zoom in a little bit onto the Go and Julia lines, you see this kind of drop off from 2019. I was initially a bit surprised to see that from a Go perspective, but it looks like actually, because it's a percentage of all questions asked, the sheer growth um, in both JavaScript and Python mean that almost any other language has this same dip. So it's actually not as concerning as it looks. The second graph is around modules. So how many libraries are there available? And again, Python massively overshadows. So uh, from the Go point of view, um, a lot of what we needed is actually available, um, but it's still comparatively smaller to some of the more mature um, programming languages. A uh, really nice little tidbit is that Kubernetes is written in Go. So that gave me a bit more confidence that it might be sticking around. Julia, Julia definitely has far fewer packages, much smaller community, and I'm a bit concerned about the fact that it looks quite stagnant. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen the growth that I would hope to see if it was a language that I wanted to, you know, rely on heavily for my software product. And then Python, as we all know, um, is general purpose, easy to learn, easy to use, super amount of support, and the adoption is massive. Um, I've got a second graph that was a bit tongue in cheek. So I found this also whilst I was putting this deck together, which was a percentage of developers who are developing with the language or technology and where they've expressed interest in continue to developing with it. You can see that Python Go and Julia are in the kind of top six of those. And then you can see a list of all the languages that have maybe given a few more headaches over the years. So the next uh, criteria I was looking at is uh, performance, speed, and execution. And this is where both Go and Julia really shine. Um, so I found this nice website, which I think a lot of people are maybe familiar with, called Benchmarks Game Team. And they have a number of different um, programming uh, challenges, let's say, and that they kind of race languages against each other. Um, in almost all cases, Go and Julia uh, perform very well. Um, sometimes Go beats Julia, and in some cases, uh, Julia, in fact, beats Go. There was only one test on that website, um, which um, Python actually beat uh, any of those two, and that was the regex uh, test, where they basically have to um, use a, a simple regex pattern um, to manipulate a, a data format. So what did this mean for me? So Go, uh, the performance was super high, um, typically seen in these typically, uh, statically typed languages. Um, it is compiled, which some people complain about, especially during development, but it's super quick um, to compile. So it's almost um, n not noticeable. For Julia, um, the times were exceptionally fast, especially for um, the in, in the pool of languages that Julia is typically chosen from, which also includes R. 
you can see um, that the speeds are um, sea-like or see that's what I guess they sell themselves are as well. Um, I would say that what I put here is that Julia is not just a compromise. It, it is like quite outstanding in its uh, speed. But again, people have complained that the startup time can be slow. Um, and I didn't want to completely bash Python. I think that some of these tests also have to be done with a grain of salt. Um, there is certain things that Python do, does really well at. And there's been a lot more interest in Cython uh, speeding things up. So um, I think that there's a general consensus that for prototyping, there's not a lot better. Python is very easy to use. Um, the lack of types mean that you don't have to check a lot of things. Uh, you don't have to be super precise and you can still get something working. But I think it's hard to ignore uh, how it's slow compared to other languages. Okay, scaling. So um, when I'm thinking about scaling, again, I'm looking at will my uh, program, when I'm handling massive volumes of data and running on various different uh, machines, will it be able to handle the volume? Will it be able to meet SLAs? Can it utilize the processing power that I actually have available to me? And I've kind of put two um, important factors in measuring this, which is the whether a um, language processes with threading or uh, multiprocessing. So for Go, um, it's really built into the language. It um, specializes particularly in threading and concurrency. Um, there's some a lot of love out there for the Go routines and channels that are built into this language. Um, it makes it very easy to even for people who maybe haven't done threading before um, because it's so uh, intuitive. For Julia, actually, uh, I was reading that they took a lot of their inspiration from the Go architecture as well. So you see a lot of the advantages that Go has in Julia uh, as well. Um, they uh, have, well, they claim that they have three types of um, main features for this concurrent and parallel programming um, and it's not seen so much in Python so um, for our use case there's a famous uh, global interpreter lock that a lot of people talk about that some people don't care about as much um, for us it just wouldn't be applicable for a lot of our software I read this interesting quote that all the GIL does is make sure that one thread is executing Python code at a time, um, which seemed a little bit counterintuitive to me. Um, I also have read a lot of, of, uh, about the multiprocessing that Python has to offer, and I've tried it myself. Um, but I find it to be not very intuitive, especially when you compare it to how easy it is in Go. Um, the kind of shining light or the, the little beacon is that because Python is so widely used, it, it can make use of a lot of frameworks that might be run or written actually in other languages in the back end. PySpark is a great example of that, um, TensorFlow also. And so I think when I was looking at scaling, uh, Go and Julia kind of take the biscuit with this one. Okay, readability and ease of use. It's difficult for me to really say much negative about any of these languages when it comes to readability and ease of use, but there are some quirks. So uh, Go uh, aims to be simple and uniform. I found it particularly easy to pick up. Um, it compiles into one single executable that runs standalone and the even packages go into inside itself. Um, it makes it really easy to deploy um, on Docker or Kubernetes. One of the issues that kind of haunts this language is that uh, the generics are virtually non-existent or are non-existent. Um, it's been coming for maybe years now, actually. So uh, that's definitely proven to be a challenge. Um, the reason why you might, for people who don't or haven't used generics before, who might come from a um, different background, is that uh, things like a math.max function will only work on doubles. So um, this is a case where you can't genericize 
uh, the math function for all types of numerical variables, such as integers. And that, uh, when you extrapolate that to other bigger problems, um, can become really painful. From a Julia point of view, uh, again, really easy to use. Uh, you can use it in Jupyter Notebooks as well. Uh, has nice IDE. Uh, one of the big selling points of Julia was also that it interfaces nicely with Python, R, and MATLAB. But the issues around this language is that I've heard people say, yeah, maybe it's just another spaghetti code academic language, which I found not particularly um, nice to hear. But I kind of, having worked in many different uh, academic um, teams running and deploying and developing data science uh, projects, I can sympathize. <laughs> um, one of the most unfortunate things about Julia is that it indexes at one. Um, I don't know why they made that decision, but it's something that I still struggle to forgive them for. Um, and Python, so nice IDs. I put readable with a question mark and I'll come to that in the issues. Um, but I think it's, there's no doubt that it's super quick to get something. Now, the challenge for me is that I don't need to get something. I need to get something that I can reliably productionize relatively swiftly. And I think that's where I get the overhead of Python sometimes. Um, when speaking to a few of my colleagues and friends about this particular uh, part of my presentation, every, almost everyone had a small war story about oh yeah, I tried to do this and then this bug came back later that if I had a typed language would have been fine. Um, but the other thing that I heard was that there's just so many choices and so many options that it's got to the point where uh, you, you join a new team and you kind of have to learn what that team likes to work with. So you might have to learn a bunch of new packages that you haven't used before. Um, when you read someone else's code, they might have written it in a way that isn't instinctive to you, even if they've followed, you know, maybe Pep8 or something similar. Um, and so the final part of that story is that if you do have to learn those new packages, um, if the documentation isn't as great as we would all like, then you can often end up struggling to figure out what the function is doing. Um, this is partially because you don't necessarily know what objects it can give back and you don't necessarily know um, exactly what it can take. And that's due to that dynamic um, typing. So this is a few small code snippets I put together uh, in case anyone was interested or hasn't used uh, these languages before. Um, I just made some super simple functions that essentially select a random um, object from an array, although you could argue is it a list array or a slice in this case. I think array kind of covers them all almost. So uh, Go looks like the most verbose in this case, but you can also see that half of those lines are just taking up with the um, defining the package name and, and the imports. But inside the function, um, they could all be one single line, but I think three is quite legible. Okay, and then onto my kind of final criteria, which was data science support. And this is where Go uh, fails miserably at the moment. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of academic debate about whether we should be building our data science models from scratch or from using a few tools. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that there's a reason that Python scikit-learn is so popular and it's because uh, you can try out models that you maybe haven't tried before. You can also see loads of nice examples and it's very quick to implement. Um, stuff that you have used before. Um, there's no real established high level libraries in Go. Um, and so I think that it's still early stages. I think that the generics problem that, haunt, that I mentioned earlier might be part of the problem here because you can't generically define a, a kind of trainable model. Um, there was a really nice uh, response to a question about the future of machine learning in Go uh, on Reddit that 
pops up on, on Google if you do the search, but I've added it to my presentation in case anyone's interested. And it kind of outlines a lot of the uh, libraries and the challenges that they're facing, but also uh, looking for support to develop more. Julia has um, multiple implementation of common machine learning algorithms, and it, it kind of is trying to adopt the scikit-learn framework. So it has a scikit-learn.jl, which is um, using a lot of the, Pi the kind of popular Python uh, machine learning algorithms, and either some of them are rewritten in Julia to be quicker, and some of them um, are just kind of calling out. Um, I mentioned before that Julia is kind of known for interfacing well with Python and R, so if you are missing something, you can typically just uh, add a function that you might uh, love from a language that you know better. And Julia has been developing its own TensorFlow. It's not something I've tried, but I know that there's some good evaluations of Flux online. And finally, uh, Python, well, it's probably the most popular language used for most machine learning applications nowadays. Um, it has extensive libraries, uh, makes it a really obvious choice when you're starting a data science team or um, machine learning. Uh, TensorFlow, I guess, and a few other um, interfaces that I mentioned earlier, or frameworks, work really nicely and play with the Python very well. So the only thing that I think is worth a mention is that when you do get multiple data scientists coming from different backgrounds, you sometimes end up with both Python and R projects in the same company. And that can prove quite challenging to maintain over time. Um, and I think uh, that's just maybe a strategic thing that you have to deal with. <laughs> so I guess this is where I round up my conclusions. Um, the first thing to say is that all of these languages are easy to pick up and use and they're, uh, that makes them a good candidate, especially uh, for small companies and even more so if they are young languages because the last thing you want is to pick up uh, Go uh, and then have to spend um, many weeks learning how to write it and I, I haven't found that has been the case at all. So what's Go great for? Um, speed, scalability, structure, ease of development. And I found that there's enough support for the software, um, but certainly not for data science yet, at least. Uh, Julia, I think the, the biggest challenge it's facing is that it's not growing fast enough in adoption. Um, it's really quite impressive when you look at the speeds um, compared to Python and R, um, and it does have good data science support. Um, and then finally, Python, a uh, huge adoption, massive amount of support, and I do believe it's getting faster. So after that kind of evaluation, we decided that we wanted to use Go for our uh, runtime software, but benefit from some of the uh, data science capabilities available in Python and Julia. So we came up with a kind of combined solution, which is a little bit different from uh, combined solutions that I've typically done before. And this is uh, what it looks like. So you can see that our main software module is written in Go. That's in the blue step. You can start blue uh, square A. Um, during our um, program, we write uh, out to disk some of the data that we've already processed. Now, what's key here is that we actually do a lot of the feature generation in Go, even if we maybe discovered some of those features offline. Um, and what that does is it means that the data that we send over um, is the data that we would also be able to apply, apply a model to. So we keep as much of that computation in this fast um, language. And then in the offline training and exploration, we can ingest that data, train the model, tune the model, we can explore it, we can um, potentially look at adding other features. Um, but for the day-to-day -day running, this uh, can run any time, it can be any speed, and it can be uh, written out to disk at any time. So all that happens is that the model will get replaced with a newer version, and then our runtime uh, software 
can pick up that um, new model and actually implement it in Go. So there's this super nice library and there's many others. We were looking particularly at like GBM and XGBoost and um, this library Leaves was developed in order to be able to read models that were trained um, uh, in a different language, but be able to apply them in Go. So actually our runtime is all uh, in Go. And that's it. So um, I don't know if there's been any questions in the meantime, but. Um, hi, Alex, thank you so much. Yes, we do have a lot of questions. Thank you for your presentation, Alex Rieden. Um, so the first, que the first question is um, from Kayetan, and he wants to know, are these benchmarks showing results of default Python library, or maybe they use a C optimized libraries like NumPy, Cyton, or Numba? No, that's a good point. So um, I think I can give you a link to the benchmarks that I used and maybe we can look a bit further. What they say is Python 3. So I don't know if they also use some of these C optimized libraries, but that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second question is from Kantemel, Kante Kamel and is, was, is asking about index from one probably because of MATLAB. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, that's the only obvious uh, reason why they might have kept that. I think they also took a lot of their syntax from MATLAB. That's what I've heard. So, And again from him, um, he's wondering whether there's another spaghetti code academy language. <laughs> where do you see Python in the next uh, five years? Oh, that's a tough one to say because Python, you know, from my point of view, I think... Uh, for my use case, I'm going to be obviously trying to try and transfer to a different language. Um, but when it comes to Python has so many other use cases that I couldn't speak on them all. Um, I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. And you can see that its growth hasn't slowed down. It's only got faster. So. OK, um, we do have another question and is how from Fabian, how is finding documentation or certain solution on the different uh, languages? Yeah, so I think that um, that's quite well reflected in the graphs I showed about um, Stack Overflow. For a majority of the problems I faced, I've definitely found um, at least partial solutions. I think uh, Python Weirdly, I sometimes get challenges because there's so many old versions of Python now and there's multiple different ways of solving the same question that sometimes I think I get a solution quicker in Go because there's less options. Yeah. Okay. We do have another interesting question, Alex, uh, for you. What <laughs> advice would you give to a young researcher in the field of uh, data scientists? Um, I think it's important to have breadth in the challenges that you try and solve. Um, it's very easy to go down a route of uh, like only solving regression type problems. But I think early on, it can be really valuable to try your hand at like deep learning problems that's really much easier, much more accessible now than it was, let's say, five or six years ago. Um, try your hand at um, looking at images, try your hand at um, classification problems it's like that experience that breadth of experience early on means that you can choose to kind of specialize and get depth in one of those fields later I think yeah thank you so much Alex for your amazing presentation and your time thank you no problem thanks guys <laughs> bye okay we bye to our third speaker, which is uh, one of our South African uh, colleague, uh, and it's a data engineer working with us on WBA. And outside the work, um, yeah, he's doing great things outside the tribe, uh, like for instance, he's an excellent salsa Cuba dance instructor. And before COVID, he used to give us very nice hugs, but unfortunately due to COVID, it's all virtual now. So, um, and the title of this presentation is a Complex Docker Builds a Journey Through Tricks and Tips and Creativity. There you go, Bongani. Good luck. Have fun. Hopefully, everyone can hear me well. And if I can get a thumbs up. Oh, 
Right, okay. So I'll assume everyone can hear me well, and I'll begin presentation. Okay, so my name is Mongani, and I'm speaking to you from the ING headquarters in Amsterdam, Netherlands. If you're wondering, many of us are still working from home, but I requested for special permission here to be present here so I could avoid any possible technical difficulties. Today, I'll be presenting to you about a journey me and my colleagues went through with our complex Docker builds. Uh, my official title is a data engineer, but over what you consider what I've been doing over the past year has been more backend engineering focused. I uh, work in wholesale banking advanced analytics, and in particular, I work with a product called the Data Analytics Platform. The Data Analytics Platform is a performance-driven big data exploration platform. Uh, so what we initially wanted was a platform for where our data scientists and BI developers could focus on their jobs and not have to worry about setting up Jupyter Lab or setting up Spark in order to do their job. What we, just, what we wanted was a simple click solution where a user selects a certain set of tool sets and a container spins up with the data readily available. Uh, in particular, what I work on is a, uh, within, I work on data science in the box within uh, the DAP platform. Uh, data science in a box or DS box for short is a, a handy tool set to explore and analyze data and create models. Um, DS Box includes a Linux environment with JupyterLab, VS Code, Python, R, Spark, and all kinds of flow, including Airflow, TensorFlow, and MLflow. Uh, DS Box in itself is completely containerized, and it runs on our powerful Kubernetes cluster. Uh, what you see to your right uh, is a high-level architecture. So uh, we have this lightweight API Callisto, which interacts with the DAP platform. And Callisto is in charge of uh, creating user images. And we create those user images through GitLab. And those images will be stored in our JFrog artifactory. Callisto is also in charge of deploying these images to our Kubernetes cluster. So at the beginning of this year, we realized that we're about to hit a wall. Uh, we're getting many new user requests for uh, DS Box, and our code base was not the most pleasant to work with. Um, so just to give an overview, our Docker files were about 400 uh, lines long of Docker file steps. And for us as developers, or, uh, it was difficult to understand where if we need a change and uh, if issues were addressed, uh, if issues came up, where to address them. Uh, also, our images which were produced were quite large, so they were about 5.2 gigabytes in size. Uh, this made it actually even slow to deploy and extremely slow to build the images. To give you an overview, uh, in the best time, in one image would take about 90 plus minutes. Uh, and in the worst case, our GitLab pipeline would actually time out at the two hour mark. Uh, so. Coming up at the beginning of the year, we decided we needed to rebuild. We needed to make things better, stronger, and faster. Now, on to making things better. Well, we decided to visit, uh, revisit the Docker best practices. And I won't spend too much time on this. What I will do is I'll highlight some of the best practices we continuously do in our development process. So when you... Uh, make sure you're adopting best practices. Make sure the first thing you want to do is reduce your image size for faster builds, faster deployments, and it actually saves space on your registry. Um, the first thing to do is remove any unnecessary packages or build steps. So this will be like uh, removing uh, development tools or debug tools which you include in. Uh, so in that case, uh, as uh, things which are not uh, needed by the end user. So, for example, here, Wireshark uh, is not needed by the end user, so uh, remove it. Another tip, uh, which uh, we also found out, was that if you're using a Debian-based Docker image, so uh, and you're installing packages, make sure you include this no installs recommend. Uh, the Debian package manager actually installs uh, recommended packages automatically, even though you didn't instruct it to. Uh, so uh, it'll best to include that. 
uh, if you're using a Red Hat Packet Manager, you do not need to worry about that. Uh, that handles uh, automatically. The next thing to do is make sure, take advantage of your Docker Manager cache. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, remove any package manager cache. Uh, uh, once, when you do an install, uh, make sure you clear your package manager cache uh, because uh, this will end up being, or will remain there through the life of your Docker image. So it's good enough to remove it there. Also notice how the pack, uh, for a, a, an execution install that we chain, we chain it together. And this is to avoid having multiple steps, uh, what you do not know with multiple Docker steps. What you want to avoid to do is doing the one below. Uh, this will have, if you do the below, uh, you'll have multiple Docker steps and uh, your Docker build will actually take much longer to, to conclude. And you might actually hit where you installing from an outdated package manager. The next thing, uh, take advantage of your Docker cache and in order to speed up your, do your Docker build. So when you want to do this, you need to realize that order is important when it comes to your Docker builds. So if you make a change to a code line, or if you uh, to a Docker step, all the following steps in your Docker build will will need to be rebuilt, and that's going to cause a Docker cache bust. So in order to avoid that, uh, if you can identify any frequent changing, so like uh, in this case here, uh, you're doing code changes in, in this target file, uh, it's rather best to put it at the uh, at least most of the bottom. So you need to order your most frequently changing content uh, uh, to avoid any cache bust. Now, one thing uh, we also did was to make, ensure that we parallelize our builds. So for us, our images, we initially had two sets of images. We had a Python 3.6 image and a Python 3.7 image. And within our CICD, we only had one job, which was executing this uh, whole build step. And this is why evidently it, it took about 90 minutes and in the worst case, two hours to actually uh, complete the job. And what would actually worst case is that if there was happened to be some issue in one of the build images, uh, the entire job would fail. So it was only natural for us to make sure that uh, each uh, build produced was produced by its own job. So what we ended up doing was we modified our GitLab CI CD to build multiple images at a single stage. So we have a before here, and this is how it, before it looked. And after we did the changes, uh, now we're producing all the images here, and we even added a third image. So next, uh, we needed to make we needed to make get strong. Uh, there was a use case for us to have flexibility in our tooling. Currently, our, or previously, our form was uh, for our users was to have it all or have it all. Uh, users had little, to, had little choice in what went, actually went into the DS box. Uh, they got an, a DS box image with all the tool sets. Uh, what we thought would be nice is that if we uh, give the user an, an ability to choose what tool sets, what tools they want, in the DS box images. So, and also this would also be advantage for us because if a user choose, chose less tools, uh, it'll actually mean uh, a quicker build and it'll decrease our Docker registry space. Uh, or uh, the space would be consumed in our Docker registry. So to give you a problem description here, this is what we went through at the, uh, when going through this. Uh, think of user A. User A wants Jupyter with CUDA. Well, that means we'd have to take our base image, uh, put Python, put Node, and put CUDA in it. Or whereas user B wants Jupyter with Spark, well, then user that you will have to take the base image, put Python, put Node, put Java, put Scala, and put Spark. Whereas user C, they want VS Code with R, so then for that user, we'd have the base image uh, would need to include VS Code and R. So as you can see, there are too many combinations to cater, 
to cater for. And if we were to introduce a new framework, a new tool, a new language, it'll introduce more complexity. So what we needed was some form of a structured dependency solution, but for Docker builds. What we came across was uh, Docker Make. Uh, Docker Make is an open source uh, uh, get, uh, open source project. It's a command line tool to build and manage uh, stacks of Docker images. So with Docker Make, you can mix and match uh, different sets of build instructions as a dependency graph uh, to create maintainable and extensible stacks of Docker images. So for example, here on the right, and uh, once we adopted Docker Make, uh, you'd create a, a YAML file. And you can see here, we'd have the base image, and it'll be taken from uh, this Fusion base image, and we'd call it dev base. And you'd have all these other images, and for Docker Make, you'll have this requires to indicate that it's based on top of this other image. And for example, here we have this final image called data science image, and it requires this Python image, airline dot image, and plant dot image. And when you run Docker Make, uh, you can actually see that you get sort of this dependency graph. So here we have the data science image, and it knows that for this data science image, it requires those three above images, and those three above images require that one, uh, dev base. And dev base is based from fusion slash base image. Uh, so once we adopted Docker Make, we actually ended up with the following dependency layout. Uh, it's a very a clear, a much clearer dep dependency layout for us. So remember, um, uh, I mentioned that our Docker, uh, we had this one single Docker image, which was 400 plus lines long. Once we adopted Docker Make, we're able to actually modularize our Docker build steps and, our, and break them up into separate different uh, Docker images and base them off uh, and lay out using Docker Make to, to indicate which one would be based off which one. So this is what we kind of got at the end, uh, a, clearer, a much clearer dependency layout. And it made it easier for us as developers to pinpoint where a change should go or if we need to introduce something uh, it, it actually made it much more clear for us. Now, the next step we needed to go, as Jeremy Clarkson would say, faster. So, uh, to, to go faster, it needed to improve our Docker, our Docker build speeds. Not many might know, but uh, the Docker builder, which, which it comes with Docker, is, is quite a, a, leg a legacy builder. It has an outdated design, and the code base of the builder made it difficult to introduce any new features. So every time there's a new Docker release, there weren't that many uh, innovative features. Uh, the, Docker, uh, the Docker builder was tightly modeled with the doc, with the doc instructions and had a linear build uh, uh, design. Um, it had suboptimal uh, performance, and it uploads the entire context. And by that, I mean that even if you made a single change, maybe to even like the final build step, uh, this Docker builder would upload the entire, file, uh, the entire context, even though you changed one line. So we found out that there's a new Docker builder called BuildKit. Uh, it's produced by Moby, uh, or some people also call it Moby BuildKit. Uh, it's the new uh, BuildKit, uh, Builder, and it has new Docker file features and many bug fixes. It introduced concurrency building. It has lazy context uploading. So, unprevious, uh, so with the build kits is that if you change one file, then sorry, one build step, then that's the only build step which would get uh, uploaded. Uh, it has extremely better caching than previously. It protects your secrets and SSH keys. Uh, it works with and without Docker, and it's stainless. It's You have the ability, if you want to, to containerize build kits. So if you want to, you can have a Docker within a Docker. Um, uh, it's also compatible with your old Docker files, so not many changes. Well, you don't have to do any changes. And you might not know, but it's actually been available since Docker 18.09. Now, what did I mean that uh, the legacy builder is actually quite is linear? Well, if you take a look at the left, 
uh, when you run Docker build on your Docker file, the legacy builder actually goes from this top down fashion. So it'll just go top to bottom and it'll run each step in this uh, linear fashion. Versus build kit, when you run your Docker build, build kit actually first transverses from the bottom up. So it does a transversion and it creates a tree and it tries to identify unneeded stages or stages which can be parallelized. So what you get with Docker build is that once it runs your Docker build, it, it, it transforms it to this. So it can actually identify that it can run this in parallel and run, run these set of stages in parallel next to each other. So if you want to use build kits, how do you enable it? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, you can simply pass in this environment variable called docker build, uh, docker, docker underscore build kits one when you're running your build, or you can set in your docker daemon uh, this following configuration and you'll have Docker up and running. Now, there's some new news. Uh, this actually was announced last week. If you're using Docker desktop on your machine, uh, feel free to update to Docker 2.3.50 because they've actually enabled build kits by, by default. So uh, I'll actually suggest uh, updating your Docker desktop as soon as I uh, finish with this presentation. Now I'd like to go also do a quick demo on uh, build kits. So I have this prepared this Docker file here. Uh, you'll see here I have uh, this uh, these set of build stages here, these build steps, and I run a sleep command, and I have another set of build steps, and I run a sleep command, and I produce this final image based on those uh, set of build stages. Uh, let me exit quickly. All right, cool. Let me zoom in. Now, I'm actually gonna clear my Docker system. So uh, everything, I'm running on a fresh uh, Docker system and I'm not using, I'm not taking advantage of the cache. Uh, first, what we'll do is we'll run with the legacy builder. And there we go. There's the first leap. Uh, right here. Right, and there's the second sleep going. Exciting stuff. All right, and this took about 20 seconds uh, to complete this image. Now again, I'm gonna clear my system, uh, my Docker system, so I'm not taking advantage of the Docker cache. And now I'm going to run it using uh, build kit. And as you can see, the first thing you already see that Docker build kit has a new user interface. And we're already at the sleep commands. And you can see they're actually running in parallel over there. And this took about 14 seconds. So nearly half the time of the other build. So uh, but just by parallelizing, we just about half the time of the Docker build. Uh, back to the slide deck. Great. So other features of uh, Docker build. Uh, Docker build introduces context mounting. So with uh, the previous Docker build, if you needed to actually work, uh, introduce a file and work on it, you, need, you needed to copy that file over. So as here, you copy the file over, uh, you untar it, and if, if, you're if, you're practicing, if you're doing your best practices, you need to make sure to release it, but then you're only releasing it on the final layer. And remember, you have all these other steps, so you introduce more steps and more layers. Now, build kit, on the other hand, has this uh, new single command. Uh, you just need to turn on this experimental syntax. Now, what experiment, experiment this experimental, sorry, excuse me, the experimental syntax doesn't mean that uh, it's going to go away. They're just not sh fully sure of the syntax. Uh, so these features are there, but uh, in the future, they might change the wording or the naming of the syntax. Uh, so 
what you uh, you you do you do introduce the syntax and now you run the single command called a run mount and you'll actually mount your physical uh, hard drive or your physical the physical machine and you'd mount the files and you'd operate on those files within your Docker image. And so you don't have to copy anything over. You don't have to uh, uh, make sure that you clean uh, your, your, your Docker build as well. Another thing here, so with uh, syntax mounting, uh, so don't do what's on the left, especially if you work in a security environment, especially if you're working in a bank, do not copy over your SSH keys or uh, secret keys. Please do not do this because this will allow your keys to be available uh, later on. What you can rather do is using build kit, you can rather mount uh, using the mount syntax and now you mount an SSH and build kit will know that uh, you're mounting an SSH uh, a key and it'll make sure that, that that SSH key is only available within this run step and it's not available anywhere else within your Docker image. Uh, and to just indicate that you're passing over SSH keys when you run over run your build, uh, also using this uh, keyword. So I, I would want to talk more about build kits, uh, but uh, there's a lot of features. I just uh, my best advice is for you just to turn it on, see what it does for you. Uh, there are other uh, very good uh, features like the cache mounting, which has extremely improved, but for now, I just suggest turn it on and see what build kit does for you. Now, wrapping things up, uh, we made things uh, uh, better, stronger, and faster. And where did we end up? Well, our development process has become much easier uh, with, uh, with uh, doing our Docker builds. And we, and we were able to make uh, quicker releases and introduce more user features uh, uh, much quicker. Our time for our builds uh, images improved, improved dramatically. So our, our builds went from 90 to 180 minutes down to 20 to 35 minutes. Our size of our images were also reduced drastically and we have a better understanding of our code base. We also were able to introduce flexibility in order to uh, add new tools in the future. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening on the talk. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in more depth and hearing about it, uh, there's a QR code here uh, and feel free to scan it and it will take you to a, a, a presentation about the data analytics platform. Uh, below it is a QR code for build kits. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about build kits, that will take you directly to build kit. And if you'd like to know about DockerMake, uh, there's a QR code for DockerMake. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and I'll be taking questions. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Bogani, for the uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, we were having a look at the chat, but we don't, don't see any questions uh, so far. Uh, so if you have any questions, just let them know. Um, yeah, maybe you want to give some last words to Bugani? <laughs> no, that, yeah, yeah. thank you again for your presentation. It's especially sharing the QR code so that uh, it's easy, easy for everyone to have access to it. And then uh, just a small reminder that for, uh, for the... No, we do have a question. Sorry, sorry, we do have a question. Uh, what do you know about Docker and then that you wish you knew when you started out? So I'm not sure if we still have Bogani in the studio. Ready, <laughs> left. I'm still here. Uh, what yeah. do I wish I knew about Docker before previously? Uh, it'll definitely about uh, Docker caching. I uh, think that's one of the things uh, people uh, should, when getting introduced to Docker, you should know about the Docker caching and how to take advantage of it because uh, it's one of the factors which decides how quickly your builds are. So if you can't take advantage of the Docker cache and uh, your builds might take much longer than if expected. So I definitely say make sure you know about Docker caching. 
All right, thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, we had our three talks. Uh, I think uh, we have one item left from our colleague Nicoletta. Uh, she wants to share a little bit more about um, more the, uh, yeah, if you're interested in, in ING and you want to keep up with us, we have, uh, um, yeah, some insights and some sharings from her left. So uh, let's give the floor to Nicoletta. Hi, I'm just waiting for a thumb uh, in order to see if I'm uh, if I'm live. Thumb? Yes, all good. So uh, congratulations for this amazing meetup. Once again, the organization was perfect. So we would like to extend this nice experience you just had with after event online content. So I will say a couple of words on that. Uh, my team, Wholesale Banking Advanced Analytics, is a multicultural, diverse, and inclusive ING tribe. Um, we create algorithmic data-driven products for our clients. We love experimentation and care about diversity and inclusion. Our Medium blog mirrors who we are with a nice mix of business and tech content, including a wealth of uh, nice engineering blogs, so we make sure to check it out. And since we can't stop sharing knowledge with the tech community, make sure to also check our ING Medium Tech blog with top-notch engineering and data science content from our tech colleagues across the organization. Um, ING wants to make it happen with top talent, and some of our analytics teams, including WBA, are uh, growing and looking for new colleagues. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, check our career path. Uh, where you can find positions such as machine learning engineer, data scientist, NLP engineer, and more. Uh, we will now share all links here at our chat and at the after event email uh, you will receive. Again, many thanks uh, for attending and uh, many thanks, congratulations for the amazing organ organization. That's it from me. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, so I think one last shout out to our uh, speakers, uh, Prince, Alex, and Bogani, for your amazing talks. Uh, because I think all the questions and comments on the chat, I think people really liked it. Yeah. Um, we want to thank you, Nicoletta. Thanks a lot for sharing uh, these last um, links and where people can find a little bit more information about um, IG. Uh, the WBA18 and about what's happening in the analytics field and IT field at ING. Uh, thank you, of course, Samantha, <laughs> for, for hosting this with me. And uh, I think uh, on the background, uh, literally on the background, we want to thank Anna as Anna. well for doing uh, all the nice um, <laughs> thumbs up from her for all the coordination on, on the background. Um, yeah, I really hope you liked it. I hope you liked it and make sure to join us again for the next one, 8 October data science uh, meetup. And then on November 12th, yes, we have the next edition of the data engineering meetup. Uh, so uh, ch uh, keep, uh, please check out uh, meetup.com and Eventbrite to see your future events and uh, sign up and hope to see you then. Thank you, that's yeah. all for us. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the week. Bye. Bye.